My name's Murray, I'm from Squire & Partners. I'm going to tell you uh, the story of our office, which we call the department store. Um, and I hope um, uh, to explain to you why it's a little bit more than just uh, an architect's office. Um, we uh, were lucky enough to purchase this building down in Brixton um, about three years or so ago. Uh, and uh, we were looking to move to new offices and, and Brixton was an uh, incredibly vibrant and interesting place, almost um, uh, a counter to where we were uh, in, in King's Cross, which was becoming quite corporate. Um, Brixton has an amazing, uh, rich um, uh, cultural heritage, which we found um, enjoyable. Um, and <coughs> in fact, our building also had an amazing history. The, uh, um, the owner uh, who built this building um, was lucky enough to win quite a lot of money on the horse race uh, um, at Doncaster many, many years ago. Uh, he went to Paris, saw the Bon Marche department store there um, and thought, oh, that's an amazing idea. I want one of those in London. So he came back to London and he built one. Um, our building is the extension to the Bon Marche uh, in Brixton, which is on the other side of the road and actually is a little grander than the original building. Um, but uh, it is the original building uh, was built as a department store. When we uh, came uh, to purchase it, um, it was incredibly um, uh, photogenic, but um, was in a, a fairly interesting state of repair. And, and what was interesting to us was um, that it revealed the various layers of history um, and the various people that had uh, occupied the building, um, most recently um, the graffiti from, um, from squatters, but also the holes in the ceiling from when it was an office. Um, so we um, rather literally took the idea of, of the department store and, and organized uh, the way that we would use this building um, with our own kind of in-house departments, but it went further than that. Um, and uh, particularly um, at the ground floor level, uh, we wanted to animate um, the streetscape with other uses, not, not just our own. And so we um, uh, engaged with the community um, and uh, talked to them quite a lot about uh, retaining the post office and having other uses at the ground floor. Um, down in the basement, we, we're quite lucky in that we have um, some space that not only we use uh, for staff seminars, but um, invite other people in um, to use the space as a gallery space, exhibition, yoga classes, all open to the public. Um, our reception area um, is quite grand um, and also um, we um, have quite a big uh, model shop which we deliberately put um, up on the ground floor um, so that we could showcase our work to members of the public who find it amazingly interesting as they walk past and we are uh, in the process of um, launching our Christmas window which we um, have you, uh, worked with and uh, collaborated with a local school um, to, uh, to design um, our model shop window. Um, Circulation spaces, the original staircase was amazing and we introduced this kind of secret stair behind this black um, uh, uh, plywood uh, box at one end of the building, at the other end of the building. Um, there is an area which we call the annex which houses our meeting rooms and you, you can see here the finishes um, are, are partly new um, but also exposing some of the uh, original brickwork wherever we could. Uh, the typical office floors. There are three of those where the architectural teams uh, sit. Um, there is the existing floor and the existing ceiling are retained and the clusters of desks which we designed um, are deliberately quite close together but also there's loads of space for breakout um, and little areas you can still see some of the graffiti left over from, the, uh, um, from, uh, from our squatter friends. Um, on top um, as every uh, architectural office should have a bar. Um, we, we supplanted this amazing timber frame. We work with uh, traditional oak frame uh, carpenters um, and uh, have got what is, um, we think, a really an amazing space. Um, it has a terrace. Um, it has spaces that are uh, available to rent. Uh, we open it up to members of the public um, to use as a bar after hours, and obviously our staff use it um, all the time. Uh, this is an amazing space, which is, and I'll just go back one slide here. You can see a, a green dome at the end of the building. Um, that um, was a, a copper dome, which we um, uh, replaced with this um, fantastic green dome underneath which sits a table for meetings uh, or for hire. Um, uh, and, well, we call that the dome room, not surprisingly. We worked with lots of um, uh, 
lots of our suppliers to collaborate with and um, they helped us out in uh, supplying us with, with their goods that we slightly tweaked for our, for our own needs. Um, in addition to those big names, we worked a lot with local uh, artists and designers, Eli Kishimoto, um, local, uh, local firm, who uh, came and looked around the building before we did any work, actually, and developed these patterns based on some of the um, motifs and existing uh, pieces of, uh, of the building. And those patterns have fed through uh, into, uh, into the finishes of the carpet, uh, the lift finishes, and some of the furniture. Uh, Similarly, we work with local uh, local artists um, to um, help design our rugs, which were manufactured specifically for us. Um, and you can see all over the building there are quite clear and, and obvious references to display cases, which you would um, naturally have seen in department stores. Um, working a lot with uh, craftsmen that we um, particularly uh, have built relationships up with uh, in the years in our uh, in our other projects um, but this was a, a slightly different challenge for them using materials that we don't normally use which was um, actually part of the interest for us in this project um, we also we also have this kind of hidden talents thing in our office where um, we try and discover what uh, what other skills people in, in our uh, organization have. Um, there was uh, a girl here um, from Japan who uh, made ceramic teapots, so we, we commissioned her to make um, these tea sets for all of the meeting rooms. Um, so here, here are some more uh, of the spaces, again, working with lighting, um, uh, our existing lighting supplies, and tweaking their standard products specifically for our needs. Um, the existing palette of materials was uh, was lovely, really, and and uh, that kind of that colour palette inspired us um, uh, with the new materials to try and borrow and reinvent where we where we needed to. So the copper roof uh, became the copper roof um, of the extension on the top floor. The copper pipes internally deal with taking data and power, etc., down to the desks, um, and these black panels kind of um, uh, replicate the uh, the black metal screens that exist in the building. Um, we cut loads of holes in, in slabs to try and get this visual connection um, between, uh, between the architectural teams and the bits uh, of joists and flooring that we took out we reused um, to make our own furniture. Um, here is a small table being made uh, and this was a large table uh, in this meeting room, conference room. Uh, our in-house interiors team specified lots of furniture <laughs> um, and you can see here the uh, comparison between how we found the building um, and what it looks like now similarly externally the end <laughs> interesting that you use the architectural uh, rather subversive using um, your architectural practice as a commodity which I find it interesting um, so it's not so much your interior or your old and new strategy that I'm curious about, but rather your f uh, custom furniture that you are very conscious about. You've made a few reference to it. So one was the display in a department store becoming your reception. The flooring that was cut from above becoming uh, an amalgamation of a table that becomes part of your yeah. conference room and goes on. I see a lot of those details. Yeah. Um, how do you decide which one is, you know, the display becoming a reception is something else. The idea of a floor becoming conference table is another thing. Um, how do you decide and how does the department store aspect of it come to this I mean, strategy? You know, the, 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 um, the framework of a department store is, is a very easy and obvious framework which you can bolt ideas onto. Uh, we were conscious trying not to be too literal um, in, in turning this building into a store. And that, I mean, the, the, uh, it was very confusing for, for local Brixton people who suddenly saw a department store being built in their area where they couldn't actually buy anything. Um, and, uh, and, and we are constantly getting people coming in through the front door and saying, you know, what can I buy? Um, and so, in a way, that's kind of fun, that interaction uh, with the public. In, in um, many ways, they can buy your service. That, that's what it is. If yeah. the, yes. So that's they can, but they can interesting. Yeah, I mean, uh, it, yeah, they could 
by our architectural service, yeah, that's right. but they can also come in and enjoy enjoy some of the area, the spaces that we open up to the public. Thank you. So it is very much also a display for the local designers. So in a way, that is what you're collectively offering as a department store. I, I'm actually really fascinated to have now seen this project because I used to spend a bit of time in this building back before the renovation because uh, I had a collaboration with the tall engineers who were set there in one of the small unconverted office offices at the time. Um, what I remember from um, trying to find my way around the building was that it is a huge block uh, that sits uh, sort of uncomfortably in the middle of Brixton um, and its textures. Um, how did you resolve the lighting the lighting yeah. uh, on the typical floor, uh, externally or internally? Is there internally. A, internally. Yeah. Um, w one, of, one of the rules that we set ourselves was that there should never be any white walls in, in the whole building. Um, you know, we, we wanted to really decorporatize uh, our image. Um, and I know it's a very, you know, boring use of the term that you want. We wanted to, for our office to feel much more uh, homely, comfortable. And the lighting aspect of that is an enormous, um, an enormous aspect of how you how you create a space. Um, the reality is we probably don't comply with any regulation for an office, um, for an office lighting, um, and that was totally deliberate. And I think the scheme has benefited from design overruling the rules. Thank you. Yeah, uh, just a question: that uh, which part of the building are public, uh, open for everybody, and which are just private for the workers of, of the offices offices um, so uh, we have an upstairs downstairs mm -hmm. idea so there is a downstairs space which is open to the public for organized exhibitions seminars galleries events um, life drawing yoga that, that that happens almost every day um, upstairs is open to the public if you're a member um, mm -hmm. because we have to control the numbers um, okay so but the roof to rooftop it's yes. it's so not public yes it is. It yeah. is. Okay. Yeah. They have people have to pass through the floors to the private floors. Let's say the off-limits floors to get to the no, there's bar and restaurant. There's no, there's, there's actually a set. separate entrance. Okay. Yeah. But my question. I mean, first of all, let me compliment you. It's a wonderful building. I've been there, and I know that Thank it's you. amusing. I like the window display with the with the mannequins with the horns, but they're still there, are they? Um, they, they were moved recently uh, because we had an, another, uh, as part of Design Week a while ago, we had another designer display his uh, ceramics, so they've moved. Okay, but my question really is about the living, uh, changing, perhaps changing effect, and how that might overcome any kind of accusations of the gilded urban elite you know the architect in Brixton yeah. is probably not top of the list no, in we terms were very of favourite people no we were very concerned about that and even before we no, start I can tell from when you were talking about yeah. community and all that but it's re it seems to me that y maybe you need to kind of address those questions a little more actively like why couldn't you have a part of it where people could actually consult on how they might kind of improve their kitchen or in some way actually bridge the gap between the product the idea of a department store where you can buy things yeah. and maybe there could be some things yeah. for sale good it's not impossible the, the, the entrance area is vast yeah. for an office yeah, vast yeah. Yeah. and um, and and um, and in a sense that might help have there be any thoughts on that actually we, we have done in a small way not every day but in a small way we have had um, uh, I think it might be part of when you um, uh, design week I think when when people go touring buildings open house oh open house um, followed by LDF I yeah don't know. I, I'm pretty sure last year we we had a um, in the makers room next to the model shop we had the facility for people to come in and talk about we offered our services for free for a small scale. Okay, but that was just for the, it you was. know, for it LDF was. or... Yeah, yeah. It strikes me you need to have a yes, little program I and a person who's responsible for it. I accept that. Yeah, very, very nice office. Um, congratulations. I, I'm slightly concerned, I, and I love the textures, the sort of the raw, uh, stripped down textures of the walls. Um, 
but the acoustics I mean I saw you had wooden floors in the office floors is it lively acoustically actually no on the, on the typical office floors it, it's not because the furniture and the people soak cool. up yeah. soak up the noise it's it's yeah. really uh, it's not not a problem yeah. uh, I mean if it, if we, we've not quite a lot of holes through the building so sometimes when there is a seminar going on in the basement right. uh, lower ground floor space that noise sometimes yeah. permeates up the building but yeah. it's not thank problem you. thank you uh, thank you very much um, just a couple of questions one about uh, fresh air and daylight fresh air do the windows open simple yes. question yeah they do so that's how you control the environment through a natural passive approach um, we're quite lucky the footprint of the building is just the right kind of size if you open windows both ends you get a nice uh, fresh air um, circulation there is there is air conditioning in in there but we it's not on all the time it's only on those particularly hot days that we need it Okay, and just a quick one on agility. You've obviously taken a building that had one use and you've transformed it into another use w with a very Happy. strong theme that reflects <laughs> yeah. the previous yeah. use. Um, going forward in the future, how easy would it be to change both the functions you currently carry out but uh, completely new ones? Um, I think that it, uh, I rather hope that it stays um, as an architectural business for a quite a long time. <laughs> I <laughs> support that completely, absolutely. <laughs> That's not what you meant. Yeah, but I meant, if, what if it changed again in, the, in 50 years' time into a, an apartment building or something else? The building is adaptable. It's one of those kind of older Victorian type. I think what's great is that the floor-to-ceiling heights are so generous that um, it can transfer its life into something else and still be equally grand. Um, so I see no reason why it can't. There's nothing that we have done that would prevent somebody else transforming it into a different use. Okay, thank you. Thank you.